We are interviewing uh, William A. Huss. Uh, no, excuse me, say Hus. Hus. H U U S is Danish, but House. House. So you say Hus. Hus. Okay. So, and the name interview is William Hus. Hus. The interviewer is Michael Akey. It is uh, January 3rd, 2001, at Latham headquarters. Mr. Hus, um, where were you uh, when the war broke out? I was. Uh, well, I've been a seaman all my life. Okay. I went right from high school into the New York State Merchant Marine Academy. This was before World War II, mm -hmm. uh, 1937. And uh, prior to that, I've been, a, uh, as a teenager, I was a sailboat racer. I, I had my own racing sailboat. And I say so myself, I was very good at it. I had a good, a very fine record. So I've been attracted to sail all my life, and I've been making my living at sea all my life. I've never earned a dime on dry land. Every nickel that I've ever earned has been on something that's moved at sea, and I'm living very well right now, I might add. Uh, so when I got out of the Merchant Marine Academy, uh, I had a third mate's license. And uh, it's now called Port Schuyler, Sunny Port Schuyler. Well, I was the first. Uh, anyway. I came out of there and looking for a job. But I had a third mate's license, but nobody would hire a third mate. I, I, I was just plain school ship experience. They said to me, go to sea and, and get some experience, and then come back to us. Every interview I ever had. You haven't got enough sea time. So I just bummed around. I went to sea. And uh, when uh, I had my, uh, I had applied for a job as an apprentice pilot with the New York State Pilots, Sandy Hook Pilots Association. Uh, and so I went to sea to get some experience. And uh, lo and behold, the war comes along, and uh, they, they're looking for experienced seamen and, and uh, experienced people, and they were very short on it. And uh, I, they put me in charge of this vessel here, which is called the Wanderer. That's a picture of the Wanderer. On the back of it says, Sailboats Against Submarines. One of the oddest examples, can you hear me okay? One of the oddest examples of inadequate state of America's anti-submarine preparedness as U-boats began to attack our shores in 1942 was a formation of a coast picket patrol. Thousands of civilian power boats manned by members of the Coast Guard's temporary reserve used, patrol, used to patrol the inshore waters. An offshore patrol was formed using wooden sailing vessels painted gray and armed with light machine gun. These vessels were sent out on two-week patrols up to 200 miles offshore. Since U-boats had to run their engines on the surface at least seven hours a night to recharge their battery, it was believed that these sailboats would silently look and listen for intruders and then radio back their positions to the Eastern Sea Frontier Command so that an air attack could be carried out and convoys diverted. These seaworthy little boats were often donated by their owners and crewed by a motley collection of hardy yachtsmen, blue water adventurers, Coast Guard volunteers. One U-boat actually turned back from American coastline without ever firing a torpedo after, find, after finding his position consistently compromised by this unlikely 
adversary. Fortunately for the picket crew, the U-boats did not feel that the destruction of a wooden sailing vessel was worth wasting a torpedo. So they, they never bothered us. Tell us about that particular boat was then taken into the pilot service. And uh, I could have to tell you about the pilot command. Uh, every state that borders the, the ocean in the Union has a pilot uh, commission. And their duty is to train pilots to bring foreign ships into the land, into the harbors, uh, safely, and let me gain my thoughts a minute. It's a very unique organization, so unique in its training and thoroughness, and uh, when the war came along, the government wanted these trained pilots. They took over the Sandy Hook pilots, the people that they were working with, with this schooner, uh, took them over lock, stock, and barrel. Never added any officers to it at all. It was called the New York Pilot Command. Now, there was one in Philadelphia, there was one in Norfolk, there was one in Miami, there was one. Every major port had their own Coast Guard, of their own pilot organization brought into the Coast Guard. There's no other branch of the service that could do this kind of work. There were the Marines or the Navy or the Coast Guard or nobody from the land. So we were taken in lock, stock, and barrel uh, and made, and according to your station uh, in the pilot service, older pilots had master's licenses, uh, full branch licenses, which means they, they're graded. There's six different grades of pilots going from a deputy pilot on up and they, as you start with a 5,000 gross ton, uh, a 20 foot draft and 500 foot length. That's your first, that's a sixth grade deputy. And it keeps going up and up and up and up. You serve a year on each one of these uh, and take another exam and it's one exam after the other. It's a very long process, even today. Even today, we take the Sandy Hook pilots, still run an apprenticeship system that's not equal to anywhere else in the world. Uh, if I say so myself, we, we do a good training, jo training job. So that by the time, well, in my particular case, I started during the war, and uh, at age 22, and it wasn't until age 42 that I became a full-fledged, full-branch, full-paid Sandy Hook pilot. And that's still going on today. The shortest, the shortest, uh, even if you went to one of these, uh, if you went to one of these four years nautical schools today, operated by the state and federal. Uh, would still take you that it would take you uh, 12 to 15 years to go through the same process. We haven't changed the, the laws, whatever, uh, to, to, about training and, and making pilots. Now there is a book being written right now and uh, about this period of time. But I was involved in a uh, in a rescue. Can you cut now for a sec? Sure. While I was on while I was on duty with this uh, wooden uh, schooner, uh, I was out on patrol, and exactly six o'clock in the morning there was a terrible explosion three miles away from me. 
and there it was caused such an explosion, such a thunder, and it was so close to the entrance to New York Harbor that the people all over Manhattan, all over New York, all over the Brooklyn, all over Staten Island, it could be heard for uh, this terrible explosion was heard. It shattered glass in a buildings uh, in Rockaway Beach. Anyway, there was a destroyer lying at anchor. And fortunately, this was in January 3rd or 4th, uh, I don't have the date exact, January 3rd or 4th, the, I think it was the year 44, anchored. And all of a sudden, and the water was just like the bottom of this floor here, absolutely still quiet. It had been blowing northwest wind offshore, and there was no swell, no, uh, just like a lake out in the ocean. Well, we're 10 or 12 miles from shore. But anyway, uh, in sight of shore, uh, when this doggone explosion happened, well, at that time of year, it's not quite daylight, but it was, it was night. So I was just coming on watch, 6 a.m. in the morning, and my mate was going off watch. And we met in the wheelhouse at six, a little bit before six o'clock, and all of a sudden, wham, all this thing went off. Within three miles. Well, he looked at me and I looked at him and we went full ahead. And it woke the whole crew up, my whole crew. And I had some pilots aboard. I had two, two pilots on board, and uh, which was met, which was there. They were on. Uh, they were on, on. waiting on turn for their turn. Uh, we went chugging over to the. Uh, we found out it was a destroyer, and it was. Well, a destroyer, very modern destroyer, has a foredeck, an after deck, a raised part where the wheelhouse is, the antennas, the stack. Well, all of that was gone. There was a big V in the hull. From the water line, this way and this way. The wheelhouse was gone, the antenna was gone, the, the, the smokestack was gone. And people are jumping off the boat into the frigid waters of the Atlantic. The crew. We found out later, none of the officers, they were down in, in the wardroom when the explosion occurred, wiped out the whole, oh, all the officers except two, one of which was up in the bow, getting prepared to heave the anchor up. The other was down in the engine room and in the, in the shaft log, uh, having a cup of coffee. And those were the two, and there were two ensigns. And they were now completely separated. Here you have one officer in this end and one officer in this end and they're all waiting for somebody to say, let's abandon ship. Well, on the way toward the ship, we stretched our fire hose, because we thought we could help put the, the fire up. When we got closer, we could hear it was the ammunition going off. It was in the magazine that had blown up. And it was just like all the, the small arms of, for pistols we're going off just like Chinese firecrackers. It never stopped all the time that we were alongside. I threw one line out, put one line on the stern, just forward of the, uh, well, I hit the, uh, I think I better read what I have here, what's in the paper, because I can add to that what I, what's in the paper. When the, split, when, the, when the destroyer, Turner, exploded uh, northeast of Sandy Hook early Monday morning, one of the first vessels to go to her rescue and the last one to leave her side 
after removing many of the injured was the pilot boat Wanderer of the Sandy Hook Pilots Association, commanded by the Staten Island commanded by a Staten Islander and having a number of Islanders and their crew. The vessel now under the jurisdiction of the Coast Guard was lying about two miles from the explosion when the first explosion wracked the vessel. She, the Wanderer immediately raced toward the stricken vessels, slowing only long enough to launch two lifeboats to search the waters for survivors. The Wander, a 123-foot vessel commanded by Chief Boss's mate, William Hoos. He got a line on board the Turner, which was burning fiercely and tied up to her port quarter, just as other small, smaller uh, Coast Guard craft tied up to the destroyer on her starboard bow. The crew of both vessels, vessels, the crews of both rescue ships were transferring the injured to their vessels when the Turner's fuel tanks exploded and spewed oil all around the water. This, according to Hoos, was a minor explosion. He said his men took aboard all survivors that they could find on the destroyer, about 40, and then chopped the lines free. He explained that by this time, the water about his vessel was completely covered by oil, and it was apparent that the wanderer would be in dangerous position if these oils were ignited by the flames from the burning destroyer. The wanderer then headed for Staten Island I made a short stop. Uh, there was a, uh, another Coast Guard vessel that had a pharmacist mate. I had these burning men on board in all kinds of bad shape, and I had no pharmacist mate, no, no medical help at all. So I went before I, I was going to head back for Staten Island. I did head back for Staten Island, but I picked up a pharmacist mate on the way back. About 20 minutes after I let go with this, all these men, bound for a, uh, Staten Island, the third explosion happened and she just turned and sunk. Both ends went down and she disappeared. Uh, the Navy has never officially recorded, I've never found out what caused the explosion, but I don't think it was a torpedo. It seemed as though the explosion came from the inward, outward. And uh, I was interviewed by uh, Navy intelligence after the explosion, after the calm, after, after things calmed down. And uh, that was one of the things they wanted to know, what, what, what kind of an explosion, what did it look like? And all I could say was it looked like a giant big mushroom went up, just like you. Later on you saw pictures of the atomic bomb, but this was just like a small atomic bomb that hit this thing. And we took our, we took our passengers, our sick and wounded. I was in contact by, with radio to my people ashore. And uh, there was a the United States Marine Hospital, not very far from where the Sandy Hook pilot base was at that time, right in Stapleton, Staten Island. And I told them to send as many, I told them that I had about 40 men on board to send ambulances down because some of them were in very critical sh condition. And so I landed on the end of the, our pier and there was a whole line of uh, ambulance and they just took them off one after the other and uh, left my boat a wreck. Uh, some odd things happened. 
I had stretched my fire hose. I tried to tell you this before. I stretched the fire hose and hoping that I could put out the fire. My fire hose was an inch and a half, and I was going to put out an explosion on a destroyer. The good thing I stretched the hose because whilst I was alongside, the smoke became, you know, I was, what actually was, I was put one line out and I was working very slowly ahead on my engines, which caused this destroyer to ride up over her anchor, and now the, I was in the lee. She started to turn. All these fireballs were dropping down on my deck. I turned the fire hose on myself to keep from catching on fire. Well, they did on deck, you know. My mate, my mate was forward. It was it did yeoman work. Thank God I had a mate that I did have. He was a very brave man, a very strong man, and I had a very fine crew. Put out on the approach. Put out life, life, my lifeboats, my pulling boats. Two men to a to a boat. They're regular yawl boats that are used to put pilots on board of a ship when we don't have a motorboat in operation. There's always a second means to boarding a ship or taking a man off of a ship. That's, they can do it in any kind of weather. So I put two different yawls out and they picked people up too. And uh, I got those people out of the, out of the and I, when I left, when I, when I finally decided to go, when I left the side of the ship to go get a pharmacist mate from another Coast Guard boat, I left my boats there. Well, there was a second pilot cutter on, uh, on duty at this time, and they took my boats and my crew on board their boat while I was on the way to Staten Island. So I, I got the commendation medal for that. I must say that the uh, I missed in my other thing, my uh, t telling you about the Sandy Hook pilots. This was a group of men that uh, handled convoys in and out of New York Harbor. Now they were kind of rough at it as, at the start, but they got perfection. The, the longer we were in the war, the better uh, we were prepared. And I was in a position having belonging to the Coast Guard to see what a tremendous effort the United States and particularly New York went through to uh, for the war effort. Everyone, every, if you don't, didn't do something toward the war effort, you were, uh, there was no such thing as conscientious objective. They didn't have that word. You, you, you had to go, you had to do something. And uh, the, the sacrifices people made and the production that came out of New York, don't forget, New York was the main shipping for all military gear, anything to do. And we had a network of railroads coming into New York Harbor to take care of that movement of material across the seas. And so, the Sandy Hook pilots were organized to get these ships in a convoy, and the actual convoy started uh, in the harbor, the inner bay, in the, in the inner harbor. There was a, a submarine net gate built across the entrance of the harbor below the narrows, so that no submarine could ever possibly come into the harbor. And there was a small opening, 300 foot opening in that net gate. At given points, that net gate was closed, but when there was a convoy to sail, it was open. And if there was, just to give you some numbers, if there were 130 ships sailing from New York, in the same convoy, they all had to pass through this funnel, 100, 300 feet wide. 
and we only had 100 pilots. How did you do that? Well, the pilots that piloted the ships out to the sea were taken off their ships out at sea, and a high-speed boat brought back, and they, they got aboard the tail enders. Pilot two ships in one convoy, outbound. Out the pilots got such a, did such a tremendous, tremendous job that Franklin Delano Roosevelt, this is an ad from Sea History magazine that the Sandy Hook pilots put in today. It's a picture of what the present pilot boat looks like. But the quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt says, your staunch pilot boats are always ready in storm and fog, and they take skill, courage, and long years of experience to carry on this important and hazardous work so necessary to our commerce. I, crown, I congratulate you on your remarkable record. Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, your turn. The Wanderer. Yes. It was a schooner? Yes. Did you describe she was, it? She was, uh, she was a typical, if you'll notice the Wanderer does not have a bowsprit. Everybody thinks of a schooner as being a, having a bowsprit. That boat does not have a bowsprit. So that's a typical Grand Banks fisherman. Exactly what it should. A man liked this schooner so well that he had it built as a yacht. He had one built and instead of using the fish hole, he put staterooms in there. When and was it built? It was built, uh, oh, I would say she was about 10 or 12 years old when the war came along. And she was very sturdily built, built the same as you would take a, a, a back in those days, he went right to a, 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 a shipyard that knew how to build a, a, a similar tent that had built many more like it, except he made his a yacht. And when did you first see it? Uh, when I first saw it was uh, the first day I came to work as a pilot. <laughs> Uh, as a pilot apprentice. You were assigned to that ship? Yes. What was your impression of it? Oh, she was a great boat. She was, uh, she, she, she sailed kind of sluggishly. She, her rig had been cut back and she wasn't, uh, uh, well, she, I saw as I could say, she's a, she sailed like a, uh, compared myself to a racing boat. She was not a racing boat. She's a commercial boat, so she sails very slowly. Uh, but it's perfect for the, for, for the picket patrol. The diesel engine? Diesel, yeah, big diesel engine. An air, air start diesel engine, started by compressed air. Uh, a typical patrol was how long? Uh, ten days on, ten days, uh, ten days on, three days off. Generally under sail? Uh, no, only when we're, only when we were, uh, only at night time. We, we'd put up, put up, we'd put up on the sail just a whole position, you might as well say. We didn't have to go anywhere. We weren't going to go anywhere. We put up the sail to, enough to handle it, so she to answer the helm. Okay. So, you're, you had a particular spot. You had to well, two different things here now. On, on the picket patrol, I was from uh, Cape uh, Montauk Point to Cape May, New Jersey. That was the picket patrol. This boat was then taken into the pilot service. So, a different when, when it came into the pilot service, that didn't you were off the picket patrol. You were still part of the picket patrol. So yeah. I was doing double duty, as it were. I was doing picket and I was doing pilot at the same time. And it was armed with 50 caliber machine gun? No. That's 
that, that was in that article. I had uh, I had a single hand just to keep in case of the mutiny I, <laughs> on board. That that's, I was the only one with any arms, and I, I put I never used the darn thing. I just used it. I was issued the thing because I was a officer in command. Did you ever spot a German yes. vessel? Yes. On, on the surface? Occasion, on one occasion. One came up right alongside me. I would, well, then split in different, between here and that wall, a hundred feet away. And what was his reaction? Nothing. Just I, I did nothing and he did nothing. He just came up to get, get some air. Was there anything that uh, that showed that you were a Coast Guard vessel? No, not at night. You wouldn't know. No, we had. No. So no? Uh, he just assumed that you were. You were efficient. I was efficient, though. Yeah. That, that probably saved yeah. your. Oh, sure it did. Well, I don't know whether he would. Uh, they, there has been a book written by a captain who was a German and in charge of a, of a, of a German sub, uh, the whole story of how eight different submarines started out from Germany and they were told, only use these torpedoes on, on good targets. And they laid offshore, anywhere along the Long Island shore, anywhere on the uh, Jersey Shore, anywhere from Cape Hatteras north, let's put it that way. They had their choice. So they waited for ships coming to New York because that's where most of them were. So between Cape May and New York on the Jersey, the, the shore lights silhouetted these ships coming into New York without convoy. No convoy. So these Germans, smart enough, they'd look at a ship and get this silhouette and say, well, there's a good big foul in there. Let's, let's hit that one. They had those sitting ducks. They had their choice of which vessel they were going to expend the torpedo. And bang up. Go away. Run away. Go down the bottom again. Submerged when daylight came, and and uh, run off the batteries, come to the surface again as soon as dark came, and recharge the batteries. They they could also run. Don't forget, they could also run during the nighttime, with uh, on the surface, with their diesels. It was in the daytime that they were hiding. Now, we didn't have that much, uh, we're only talking about a very small part of the war. This, this situation only landed, lasted nine months. The very first nine months of the war, th this situation happened. After that nine months, an army general wrote a letter to the president and said, it was Marshall, as a matter of fact, General Marshall. He said, Admiral King, you better start convoying our goods up and down the coast because we're not getting the, the stuff that we're supposed to be getting to send it overseas. So it was an army general that put the fire underneath Admiral King's rear end and said, convoy these ships. Well, once the convoys came, the torpedoes went back. Uh, the uh, submarines went back. Then they formed the wolf packs and attacked the sea. Well, that's a whole other story. So you, you were on uh, the picket duty for about how long? Total time? Nine months, I'll Nine say. Nine months. Yeah. And after that? Pilot service. Pilot service. Yeah. Um, the boat was then taken into the pilot service. Uh, and I said we did double duty. Okay. We did double duty. Okay. Uh, then you were operating as a regular pilot. Yeah, a pilot boat. Boat. But this is a boat that, trans that transports pilots from the shore to the sea. 
when the demand is for it. Mm -hmm. it's, it rarely does balance where you have a, we have a, let's start the pilot service. Today and during the war, there is a pilot cutter out in the ocean with a launch that takes, either takes a pilot off an outgoing ship by the launch, goes alongside, drop a ladder, pilot climbs down into the small boat, the small boat goes over to the pilot cutter. The pilot cutter is a floating hotel for pilots between the outward ship and the inward ship. And that was the case during the war. Now, when, in the case of convoys, we bring all kinds of equipment out there. Uh, ships out, outbound, they would hit, hit this funnel that I spoke about one at a time and go in a line loaded to the gills, each one of them, out to the sea. So they were in a line and they could take the pilots off one after the other. But an inbound convoy, it was the, the convoy would break up offshore of the pilot station and there would be a double line of empty ships coming in, racing in to pick up a pilot as quick as they could because the, there was no convoy anymore. They just get in as fast as you can. Liberty. Oh, wait. So, uh, your, um, your main station is Staten Island? Yes. Here, eight. Um, where were you when the war ended? When the war ended, I was still in command of the school. Okay. And after the war? After the war, I became, uh, I wrote my exam for uh, a master's license. And after you become a master, you're able to start the, the pilot uh, procedure. That's how you start your work. Well, you, you work as an apprentice. This pilot car that I spoke of out at sea is manned by the deck department, is manned by pilot apprentices. The lowest deck hand to the captain. They are apprentice pilots, and they work their way up, taking exams for each one. It's it's a, it's a long, long process. Two years between the third mate and first mate at sea on the job training to become eligible to sit and write your second mate's license. Another two years at sea, you become eligible to write your first mate's license. Between first mate and master, you have to wait three years. So it goes. Okay. Now, after you become master, then you can be stuck about being a pilot. And you start at the bottom of the ladder again. Sixth grade, fifth grade, so, so the first grade. Do you, uh, do you know whatever happened to the wanderer? Yes, she was sold and uh, uh, really don't know what happened to her. She was told, she was lost under tow. She, somebody bought her, was going to use her down in the islands. And she was under tow and she ran into a storm and the tow line broke and she, she wound up on the beach in some island. That was the end of her. Well, there's glory at hand. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you have any other? Um... Well, thank you very much. This was uh, this was interesting. I had never <laughs> something I hadn't even thought of. Well, uh, you should. This group should. Your group should look into.